Hello, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, today I have a really exciting guest. I talked with him once before on the Darkness Dwells podcast, and I'm really excited to uh, talk with him again. Of course, I'm speaking with Daniel Brom. Hi, Daniel. How's it going? Hey, Jason. How are you? So uh, do you want to go through a list of your uh, publications uh, so people can uh, go and check all that out? Oh, wow. People, can, can we do like a top 10 list? Can we get David Letterman in here or something? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. <laughs> like that. Uh, I don't think we have 10. But no, I mean, hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Daniel Brom. Um, yeah, the most recent book that I have, I write I write a lot of short stories. Um, I have like three collections. The most recent one is uh, Underworld Dreams by Levy Press. And that's a collection of uh, strange tales, weird fiction, like um, Twilight Zone kind of stories that play upon the tension between the supernatural and the psychological. Um, which is a hallmark of, of my short stories. There are other there are two other collections. Uh, the second one, which came out from Independent Legions Press, is called The Wish Mechanics, Stories of the Strange and Fantastic. And my first collection, um, which came out from Cemetery Dance, is uh, The Night Marchers and Other Strange Tales. So those are my books of short stories. Um, I had a chapbook from Dim Shores Press called Yeti, Tiger, Dragon. That was like a crypto zoological uh, stories. And the, the novella that I talked with uh, Jason and Michael on Darkness Dwells was called um, The Serpent's Shadow. Um, and now it's out. That was out by Cemetery Dance. And, um, and that's, that's, my, uh, that's my list, my top, uh, what is it, my top six. <laughs> we'll have to fill in to get a top ten going on. Okay, so um, from reading your, uh, your Facebook and that, I've, I've noticed uh, something uh, quite interesting that I didn't know about you, and that's your, uh, you're a cyborg. <laughs> this is true. I was uh, meddling with my cybernetic parts just before we, um, just before we came on. No, I got, um, I'm a diabetic, so I just got that, uh, the glucose, the glucose meter, the glucometer. Okay. So it's like this tiny, 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 tiny little needle in there. So, so, um, Yet I'm still on the on the side of Skynet, and I'm trying to destroy the world. So do you, do you get like little uh, little feeds in your brain telling you what to do? I must destroy Jason. What? No, nothing at all. I never get anything like that ever. <laughs> I hear that same thing. It's weird. <laughs> um, I want to thank you for sending me a copy of uh, Underworld Dreams. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, one thing I love about your fiction overall is how. Uh, you take us, the reader, and you take us only to, like, the very edge or the border of what's really going on. There's, like, this big underbelly of stuff that uh, we get a glimpse of. And so I was wondering if you, as the writer, do you know, always know what's what's going on in that deeper well? Or or is it a mystery to you as well? I think, I think it depends. I think it depends. Um, I would love to say... Um, I think it's good advice to always know what's going on, but I could probably contradict myself at any given time and say and say quite the opposite. Um, and sometimes um, it depends on the story, you know. In some in in some stories, I really um, there was one one story called the Monkey Coat, where it's like maybe it's a great example of this. It's where um, the reader and the characters are not sure if this coat, is it a haunted coat? Is this something supernatural going on? Or is this just someone having a breakdown and committing crimes and, and using the coat as a vehicle or a projection? So, um, you know, that's a story I get asked about, like, oh, what is it? Is it the ghost or is it this? And I never, I never just, even though I have, okay, what I want it to be, I never decided on that because my job as that I gave myself as a writer was I wanted to craft it where it worked. I really wanted it to work like a Rorsch blot. Like some people be like, no, it's definitely, it's definitely a ghost. It's definitely haunted. Or to some people be like, no, 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 it's definitely psychological. And so I wanted to have something that supported both of them. Um, in other stories, I have an idea of exactly what what's going on. Like you said, like the bottom of the iceberg. 
but it's the fun, hopefully to the reader and fun as a writer, just to show that tip, but to have the story still somehow communicate the weight of the rest of it, you know, uh, and hopefully, hopefully in an emotional sense, you know. All right. So, uh, one thing I've been doing since I started interviewing people on, uh, on, uh, on YouTube here is I've been getting them to do reading ex excerpts because I love, I love when you're at a convention and, and there's readings, I always go to the readings. So I asked you, uh, to do a reading and I'm so glad that you agreed. Um, what are you going to be sharing with us? Oh yeah, so I'm gonna read. Um, I'm gonna read from uh, Underworld Dreams. I'm gonna read an excerpt from the story um, uh, "How to Stay Afloat um, When Drowning." Uh, it's uh, it's the first story in the book. Uh, it was also reprinted in uh, the years uh, the best part of the year twelve, edited by Ellen Dallow. So I'm gonna read a small excerpt from that, and it's a self-contained uh, it's a self-contained little excerpt. It's not in the beginning, but you know, the story, um, uh, one of the things in the story, it's, it's a, the main character has made a vow to, um, to never leave sight, <laughs> never leave sight of land again. Uh, and it's a story of a lot about fishing and sharks. So this is a little excerpt just uh, is the little background, self-contained background as to why uh, he, he feels that way. So. All right. Okay, an excerpt from How to Stay Afloat When Drowning from Underworld Dreams. The dock where I spent so much time with Nina isn't far from here. Salt air smells the same 10 years on and isn't easily forgotten. I try to conjure the feel of her hand against mine. I'm not sure which memories are of real sensations and which are just fabrications dulled by the years. Wind rustling the seagrass brings a sense of vast, open stretches of sand back to me. The night bird's honking cry echoes over the water. <clears throat> the ocean breeze has tussled Nina's black bob into a wild tangle, framing her sun-touched face. I can smell her last cigarette though she swears she's quit. She leans in and rescues our melting ice cream cone with a well-timed lick, followed by a big sloppy smile that transforms her. She ceases to be the depressed soul who thinks and talks so much about art school, but never paints. I no longer see the streetwise girl running away from school, from the city, from what she calls conformity and everything. But instead, she is an ethereal, sensual, carefree being here, watching the waves and afternoon surfers with me. Me, the would-be surfer who's never stepped on a board, with the afternoon sun warming my shoulders through my t-shirt and her sticky hand around mine. I think maybe this is all life is, pairing up, and running away from whatever it is you are running away from. Together, like this. The end of the pier is crowded with people fishing, holding hands and wave watching like us. The break isn't so hot, but there are still surfers out there hoping the left will develop. Someone in the water is yelling. Nina and I push over to the railing to look with everyone else. A young man has hooked a thresher shark on a line. The panicked fish spins and spasms as it is hoisted from the waves. A half dozen people have their hands on the line, helping bring it up. The shark swings and manages to smash itself on one of the concrete support pylons. The people pull and pull and bring it up all the way to the rail. A woman leans over and gets her arms around it. Someone holds her waist and pulls her in. The crowd grabs hold of the shark, lifts it over the rail, and drops it on the pier. It flops and twists, its open mouth revealing a maw of dangerous teeth and the steel hook that snared it protruding from its lower jaw. No one wants to go near it now. A widening circle of space 
forms around it as everyone backs up. The woman who first grabbed it emerges, brandishing a baseball bat. Her blow connects with the shark's side, right under its dorsal fin. It flips, landing on the steel hook, driving it deeper. The woman slams the suffocating thing again. Then the mob is all over it. This isn't fishing. This isn't protecting anybody. Our ice cream splats onto a puddle of blood and salt water. The shark is beaten into an unrecognizable shape. I realize Nina has never seen tears in my eyes. In the chaos of kicks and bat swings and skin and scales, it dawns on me we're drowning. We're drowning here. Let's go, Nina says. I'm with you. No, I mean it. I mean, let's really get out of here. Anywhere you want, I say. Anywhere at all. The silver setting reminds me of a wave curving around the small blue opal and two tiny diamond dots. The plan is to ask her to marry me at the lodge at night after we see our first fishing bat. Maybe I'll draw a bat while we're down here, Nina says, all the bouncing on the dreadful road making her voice vibrate funny. The awful bus ride doesn't dampen her spirit, and she kisses me as we lug our bag from the bus stop to the shore. The roaring ocean and clean air are so welcome. We're warmed we're warned by the two boatmen not to go in while we're waiting for all the passengers. After 10 minutes or so, they decide there are no other passengers. There's water in the bottom of the wooden boat. The older man pushes off the beach and jumps in. The boatman on the motor guns it as we crash through the wave line. The boat catches air and lands with a heavy thunk. The older boatman leisurely bails water with half of a plastic jug. We motor to the estuary at the mouth of the river, which is the only way to the lodge. Swells lift and drop us. I don't like the look of the waves we're going to have to pass through on our way, nor the way the boatmen are bickering in Spanish. It's rough, the younger boatman says to me. We may have to go back and try again tomorrow. But it's almost dark, I say. Where are we going to stay? Don't sleep on the beach. The sand flies are not very nice. The men speak to each other in Spanish. We're going to try, I ask. The boatman guns the engine. I grasp Nina's hand. The water in the bottom has soaked our packs. The older boatman is bailing in earnest now. A big swell lifts and drops us. We spin and spin and wind up with our port side facing land. The boatmen yell at each other as the boat is dragged along parallel to shore. Waves hit from all sides. The water fills up faster than the old boatman can bail. Can you swim? The boatman asks. What's happening? Kiss your wife and pray. <clears throat> the older boatman stops bailing and throws a small wooden crate overboard. Then a full jug of something, motor fuel maybe, then a bag of oranges he has fished out of the calf deep water. He grabs my pack and I stop him. We watch the jettisoned stuff spin away in the current. Large, dark shapes are moving beneath the surface. I spot a lone dorsal fin heading towards the crate. Nina is perfectly calm, though she is squeezing my hand as hard as can be. Behind her, a big wave is coming up on us, sideways. Her look of resignation inspires a burst of sadness and anger. The boatman guns the engine. The wave slams us. We're soaked, but somehow we don't go under and emerge from the blinding spray, shooting towards the shore. The sweet woman who runs the lodge escorts us to our cabin which is on a secluded rise nestled into tall palms at the edge of the rainforest. Through the big window, taking up most of the far wall, we can see the water that almost dragged us down. There is an assortment of pots and pans, a hairdryer, a small electric radio, towels, a flashlight, 
and a can of bug spray lined up on the counter next to the sink in the kitchen area. A thick extension cord runs through the front window, bringing power. The shower runs on rainwater. We thank her and flop our bedraggled selves onto the big bed. When the woman leaves, Nina cries softly. We fall asleep in our soggy clothes. The distant sound of waves, no comfort. We wake in the night. The waves have quieted. The tide has receded. A coral reef and fish are visible in the clear water, their tropical colors illuminated by the full moon. The balcony outside the window is bigger than my apartment. A metal tub, a coal grill, and bucket are the only things on it. We peel ourselves out of our clothes, heat up buckets of water, and fill the metal tub. From our bath, we watch the fish in the water below and spot bats flying by, grabbing insects. I rub Nina's shoulders gently and whisper, we made it. This inspires a fresh round of sobs. What is it? What's wrong, I ask. People don't get it. Get what? They don't understand. The only thing that's real is how we treat each other. Nothing we do is gonna be remembered. Nothing I say comforts her. After an hour, I decide to trek down the cliff to the main area, see if I could find ice cream or anything that might cheer her up. I return to the cabin and notice the big window is open and the power cord is running through the balcony. Nina stopped sobbing. I don't like the low pitched buzz coming from outside. Nina? She's motionless in the tub. Her head's tilted back, staring at the sky with that same awful resignation that came over her on the boat. I'm confused at why the cord is out here until I see the submerged hair dryer. A blue arc jumps from Nina's bruised skin, joining the pink and orange bolts that crackle over the water every second or two. The awful sound is coming from the radio floating by her feet. The reek of ozone and burnt hair hits me, and I understand that what she has done was no accident. I told myself a lot of nevers that night. Never leaving sight of land is the one I've kept. I must not have truly meant the rest. I spot the woman from the bar on the bend of the dark road up ahead. I walk faster and try to catch up. And that's the end of the section. All right. So, uh, my God, like that was quite the uh, quite the story to start the uh, the collection with. It's so heartbreaking and intense. <laughs> yeah, we'll start. We'll start the show off on a cheery note, right? <laughs> <laughs> now that we're all happy. <laughs> No, but uh, honestly, so that, much, that, yeah. that that story really hit me hard for the two scenes that you uh, basically covered there. Um, um, the suicide, which is, is heartbreaking. Um, but also, uh, and this this is the scene I've noticed in, when uh, doing some research into this book and some of the interviews that you've done, um, this scene keeps coming up in reviews too, because <laughs> it's, it's, it's brutal. And that's the uh, the brutal, fatal beating of a shark. Um, was that difficult to write? Um, you know, I, I want to say yes, but um, that was so, I guess it was something that I carried around with me a long time. So maybe it was difficult in a different sense of the word in that th that was something, the inspiration for that was something that happened to me very early on in life. Um, when I wrote the story, I knew that that was going to be the core of the story. So um, it wasn't difficult to write in the logistical sense because that was the part, you know, we as writers, sometimes there are things that are clear and we know we're going to write them and then the other paths of the story uh, take some more work and more time. So, you know, it was just a, a yes and a yes and no uh, on that. Do you think maybe um, the suicide was harder to write? 
absolutely absolutely i think um and again um that's like a yes and no answer because um there was a certain point in my journey as a writer where i it was pointed out to me that i was writing around things or i was writing around difficult things and there were two people in my life that helped me with that um i'm thinking to uh, there was one of my teachers in a workshop was uh, editor editor and author gardner dozois and i first i thought the guy was a psychic and, and i'm not even joking here i joke about being a cyborg i make a lot of jokes but this this editor he he's so talented and his reputation comes with good reason he he read all of my submissions for the workshop and he read a particular story and it was supposed to be an hour long um, consultation. And he was just able to say, um, he was like, oh, this story was probably inspired by this, this, and this, and you didn't write this, this, and this. And I was like, there was no, it was something I hadn't told anyone. I had no idea. His just instincts as an editor were so so on. And his instruction to me, and it sounds so cliche, but it was like, it's a driving force in my writing after that point, which was about 15 years ago. He was like, you got to figure out these things that you don't want to write about those, the things that are, that are the most, you know, those secrets or, you know, the things that you don't want to write that you don't want to share. You got to figure out a way how to write them and put them on the page. Um, fast forward to um, right around the time when my second collection, the wish mechanics was coming out. Um, I just sort of, stumbled upon and accidentally became friends with um, uh, Dallas Meyer, AKA Jack Ketchum. And I had taken a class with him at, and his big uh, teaching push and also his, his big, um, I'm not very familiar with his work, but I know the one thing I take away from, you know, what Dallas tells his students is don't look away. And, and I think it's the same sort of thing where it's like, when you when you come on to those difficult things, keep on it, even if it's difficult, in any sense of the word. So I'm sort of rambling on that answer there, but those were two two anecdotes I like to say um, in, in relation to writing about the tough stuff. No, it, not rambling at all. I find uh, uh, I love these these types of answers because there's so much knowledge in them. I mean, honestly, um, and you know what? I met Jack Ketchum. Uh, I think it was 2007 in Toronto and he was a really wonderful person. So Amazing. humble. Like he, he didn't have yeah. much of an ego. Like I, I was just starting in the whole thing and uh, I was, out, I was smoke, I was a smoker at the time and I was outside <laughs> having a cigarette and there were so many people outside having a cigarette. He came up and, and hung out with me and, and that meant the world to me. Like he didn't have to come up to me, but he did. And we started yakking. And it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. May he obviously may he rest in peace. Yes. Um, his that's you know what a great thing to be remembered by not only to be remembered by your talent, but yeah to be remembered by the absolute. Um, despite his success, just how genuine he never um, he never became something else. He always remained a really genuine person and was always incredibly gen genuine and genuine. Um, with his time and that's just such that's that's such an inspiring thing to me yeah and he was also uh aside from his writings obviously he was a great storyteller in his writing but when you're talking to him he was a great storyteller uh because he would go into oh, stories <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the stories i heard from that man oh my god you know yeah. he lived uh <laughs> he lived he lived quite a life quite a life yeah for sure um getting back to uh uh, how to stay afloat when drowning though um you did cite at the end in your author's notes that uh uh that the tanneth lee short story our skins are finer was uh was an influence to this story and so of course i immediately had to go and hunt it down which actually took some some work <laughs> yeah it took a little it. Work. Where, where, where did you find it it's only uh I, I think it's only out in two or three places, right? I mean, there's a collection of hers um, that Dreams came out Life? after her death. Uh, I can't remember oh. the name of it, but uh, it's all seaside stories, basically. Oh, I have. Okay, good. Okay, I'm glad that it's more accessible. Yeah, it, it came out. Uh, I'm like a nerd. Like my favorite stories. That's one, obviously, one of my favorites, and I love to 
find original appearances. I first read it in her Arkham House collection, Dreams of Dark and Light. Yeah. And I just pulled it off the shelf in my local library as a teenager. <laughs> um, the other place it originally appeared was in the Twilight Zone magazine. And then I think, uh, I don't know, Legends of the Mar or Stories of the Mar is probably where you you read it. So I'm glad that it's, yeah. it's a little easier to find now. Yeah, well, it actually wasn't easy to find because I don't think it's exactly oh. <laughs> selling. So it, it didn't show up on the yeah. Amazon search. Usually if I want a short story to read that somebody's recommended me, I'll just type this, the, the title of the short story at the top of Amazon and it'll show me whatever collection or or anthology it's in, right? But this showed nothing and I had to go hunting Ooh. on Google <laughs> and finally I found I'm something. Glad, I'm glad you hunted it and I'm glad... Uh... I'm always I'm really happy if if uh, someone has read Tanith Lee. I feel like she's woefully underread. Yeah, well she's she's written so much. My God, that you know hundreds, anytime hundreds of books. Yeah, anytime I hear something that I haven't heard of from her, I have to go and check it out because uh, I'm like, what? I didn't. I never heard of this one. <laughs> so thank yeah. you for that because it's a wonderful story. I can see why you would craft something like be influenced by something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I think it was a story that influenced me for a long time without being aware of it. And then when I was, then when I, I finally became aware of it, um, I didn't want to write the same story. I mean, there's a repentant hunter. I mean, in beca and because there's skins of finer, there's a repentant hunter. There is definitely a very much an anti hunting, um, seal hunting uh, feeling about it. And I wanted to um, right make an. Uh, I wanted to go into that that same ground without covering the same ground. So that influenced a lot of my choices. I do a lot of pre writing. I like to. Um, I like to think about the story. I like to tell myself the story or be able to tell someone else the story before I put pen to paper. So um, thinking about the ground that because their skins are fine or covered was always on my mind when I was going through that process. Very cool. Now, um, I like what you said there about uh, uh, doing like false starts in a sense with sh when you're writing a short story. Uh, can you explain what that process might be like? Oh, what was that? Did you say like like um, like you, you give it a trial run? I, I forget the exact term. And run. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I like to. Um, I guess um, there are some people. I guess there are two schools. There are more than two schools. There are some people who like to. Um, you know, they only see the road ahead of them or they don't, they don't plan. And then there are other people who like, they plan and they plan and they plan. Um, so I guess I fall, I fall into the, the planning side. So I, before I, before I I'll go and start writing uh, the story, I really want to know, I don't want to discover it on the page. So I want to discover it in my mind or I want to be able to um, tell you like, like you'd be like, Hey, damn, what are you, what are you going to write about? And I would be, and I would want to be able to, tell you as much of the story be like oh yeah okay it's a story about this guy and he doesn't he doesn't want to he doesn't want to go out on uh on the water why is that oh because of this awful thing that happened to him well what's happening to him now well he has to help us you know i want to be able to at least like kind of ramble the stories if i was telling you trying to convince you um to have like the the structure and skeletons of it often i stray from the path but um that's just my writing process everyone's different there's no right or wrong on that i one reason why i asked that as well you, brought, you you mentioned it and that always that piqued my interest because i find learning about other writers process uh fascinating and i don't know if that if that's because I, I love writing myself but i just i'm really drawn to how other people do it i yeah uh i've, I've been hurt i've been told that you know like i feel like um Oh, I'm always so boring when I'm talking about writing or that people don't want to hear it. But I'm always told that, you know, people are interested. Um, I, for one, am interested. Yeah, I don't know why. Just because maybe I love writing. I love reading. And I'm so interested in authors and their stories. I'm so interested in creativity on how I might learn or might be able to help someone. Um, hey, I, <laughs> I think it's exciting. Yeah. Now, the last time we talked um, was pretty much – during the death throes of uh, of Darkness Dwells podcast, and uh, it didn't die badly. I'm, I, I often make jokes about this. It, it died mostly because of scheduling issues and and real life circumstances. <laughs> but it, all good all good things have a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> but you know, you find me doing this more. It's like I just can't stop. But anyways, the last time I talked to you was the first time actually, and it was on the Darkness Dwells podcast. And you mentioned something that really struck me. Um, you said that the uh, the works of Sh Shirley Jackson and Robert Aikman and similar writers, I, I don't think you just named those two, but those are, are the two I remember. Um, mm -hmm. they, they got you excited to write. And I was wondering if those, uh, it, I was wondering if those authors still excite you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I probably mentioned um, I'm, the, the one that really um, that really did it for me was was Robert was Robert Aikman. Um, per, personally, um, I think I was probably telling you about when I first started writing, I didn't even I didn't really know what I was writing. I didn't come to writing with an awareness of genre. Ah. Uh -huh. I love Aikman. Oh man, I love. Uh, I, I don't know if we should go down the rabbit hole. I'm dying to talk about the Wine Dark Sea, the short story. But um, keep keeping it short, um, and for purposes of, of this, Robert Robert Aikman was the writer that where I started to un I started to understand what a strange tale was. I started to understand. Um, a lot of the nuances of, of genre of weird fiction, and again, these things um, they meet they're they're all the importance in the world, and they're of no importance whatsoever. My personal philosophy on stories are like, hey, fiction, that's the stuff that's the stuff that's not real. So everything is fiction, everything goes. Um, but when you know when you're a writer and, and you're hired to write a book or you have a book and you're promoting it. Um, you know, these things become important or they take on different meanings. So uh, Robert Aikman was the writer that I, I finally understood that the things that were important to me in a story, both as a reader, what I like to read, and, and what I wanted to do as a writer, I wasn't alone in the world. That, oh, someone someone has done this before me. Oh, not not only has someone done this before me, there is like a, a, a branch, a branch of the, the genre. There's a branch of history that's doing it. And for me, that that author was Robert Aikman, and the short story very specifically was a short story, um, Swords. And mm -hmm. um, it was at a World Fantasy Convention uh, on Robert Aikman, and the author Peter Straub was telling the audience about the Swords, and and then telling he's like, after this panel, go to the dealers' room, buy that book, and read it. And you know, I followed <laughs> Peter Straub's uh, advice, which is never a bad idea. And it was just really, it was really a life changing moment for me as a as a writer because. I understood, it gave me great confidence to do the things that I was doing. And, and also it was the first piece of a new set of, of skills or um, tools uh, in what I was already doing. So um, that's the summary, the wordy summary of uh, that little bit of our darkness dwells. Uh, I probably went off on that as well back. <laughs> I, I find it incredible that you mentioned swords because that was my very first Aikman story and my god oh, what, a, what a way to start reading his work what a way to read start off Aikman right I yeah mean, uh, that um, story is so strange and so far out there it's it starts off normal enough but it gets weirder and weirder and weirder as it goes you know yeah I'm glad that you said how it, it start quote unquote it's it starts off normal enough because I feel like that's a if there could if you could say that there's an element to Aikman or an element to the strange tales it's yeah the stories have to be grounded right like you have to have the verisimilitude you have to believe in the world for it to depart you know and aikman um it's amazing the way that he um his stories will always pack an emotional punch and will always be that his narrators who are very down to earth have experienced something that not only they can't explain you and I can't explain them. What I don't want to spoil the swords, but what what happened in the swords? We can't tell you. I mean, we could tell you what happened. Okay, there's scenes where someone is being punctured by the swords. Why did that happen? How did that happen? It's not even like a choice between X and Y. Like we just don't know. And it was. I feel like it was done. Um, it was done intentionally, and done. If, if Aikman works for you, and Aikman doesn't work for everyone, 
if Aikman works for you, it's as smooth and as organic as can be. You know, uh, and in lesser hands, and my hands are much very lesser, you know, when you're trying to achieve that, you know, you're playing uh, with fire or a slippery slope or you're playing with ice, you know, like it's easier said than done to achieve that. Um, but it's so exciting to me. I feel like it's so exciting to me because the the benefit of that is, okay, a lot of horror deals and not knocking other kinds of horror. I love the other kinds of horror. But when you're dealing with horror that is in the known, like, okay, um, there is a vampire and he's living in that house and we've got to chop off his head. We've got to get him buried in, in uh, the crossroads. And so the stories often become about doing X and doing Y and D and Z. In the Aikman story and in the strange tales of people who write like that, like Shirley Jackson, the stories, it leaves so much room to become humanistic um, stories um, that have an opportunity to give you a real gut punch. And that that really excites me. Yeah, it does me too. Um, I, I find it funny. One thing that you said there was that uh, Aikman isn't for everyone. And that that's, you know, that's true. But I was talking about Aikman in one of my videos once, and I had a comment from somebody who's, who's, who was talking about Aikman. He said, you know, uh, Aikman is more of a, a writer's writer. <laughs> I found that kind of funny. But, it, you know, I, I think there might be Perhaps. some truth to that. Perhaps, or, you know, I think even, um, this is something I've thought about a lot. Um, do you do you like explanations or do you like not like explanations? And two of my favorite writers, Peter Straub and Stephen King, are diametrically opposed on Aikman. Stephen King is like, can't stand them, don't like it. Peter Straub, love him. Perhaps, you know, it's one of his favorite guys. So, you know, two equally amazing writers writers it's just you know do you like you know do you like your food served this way do you like your food served that way you know i think yeah. it's legitimate both both reactions are, are are legitimate you know well one thing i one reason why i like weird fiction and strange tales so much is because of the ambiguity um and the one reason why i like ambiguity is because if it's done well i find it'll give you a sense of wonder unlike anything else and it'll haunt you for a lot longer than just uh, jump scares or you know a ghost not to insult so, those i enjoy those too but i'm just saying I love, like, yeah i love them too i'm so glad that you used that term uh, you know a sense of wonder um is it a sense of awe like that's something that um i think it's maybe why when i i i, I stopped to think about it maybe when i first started writing well, i wasn't sure i didn't know i was writing horror but um yeah often Horror isn't always right, like the blood and the gore or the, the terror and the depression. It's it's all there. But in the, su the supernatural, and I guess this, yeah, this is a hallmark perhaps of weird fiction or cosmic horror, right? That sense, that sense of wonder, that sense of excitement, that sense of um, experience or um, breakthrough or, yeah, like, I know you know what I'm talking about, that, yeah. that sense of amazement. Uh, that comes from going into ambiguous and unknown territory. Often going into that ambiguous and unknown territory, we as humans is primal, it's terrifying, but often side by side by that, it's just, it's amazing and interesting. And, and we want, we want to know, you know, even if maybe it's going to kill us physically or emotionally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, we're hitting the nail on the head. Why I love like your fiction and uh, Robert Aikman and 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 a lot of other writers. Um, but we do have a, a an audience. We have a couple of questions here. Um, Nikki from Dark Between Pages. She says, Dan, do you write for yourself or do you have a target audience in mind? Hmm. I. I, I'm really not sure. I don't. I'd like to. Um, I'd like to say I write for myself. I'd like to also say that I write for an, an audience. And I think I think it's a little bit of a mix. I mean, I think I think um, the inspiration about what I write, like the things that I can't that can't be taught, or the things you, that just come to you, what I choose to write in the stories, I'm going to write for myself. I, I write. I very often do not write for themes or for open calls. But that said, 
when I'm writing, I'm not writing, uh, I'm writing very much, if not for a specific target audience, when I'm writing, I'm writing to be read. I mean, I want the, I want the writing to be something. So maybe I'm writing, uh, and maybe I'll sort the ideas to be like, oh, flash fiction idea, short story sized idea, novel idea. I'm writing to have these ideas that I have for myself to then put them in the boxes of forms that we as society um, read them in. And I mentioned that because there are other kinds of writing that are completely non-compromised and for myself. I'm also, you know, um, I'm a musician, I'm a lyricist, I'm a poet, but those, I, I don't, I'm not writing uh, for an audience or I'm not writing to be read or listened to at all. Those are the more, okay, that's what I'm writing for myself. When it comes to the fiction, even if I don't have a target audience, um, I know I'm writing to be read and I sort of have an idea of um, that there are audiences that tend to not like uh, the kind of horror that I serve up and some that tend to be more open to it. And that being said, audiences always surprise me. Like when I'm out at events, I see people like, I'll have one of everything. Or like, oh, they'll take some body horror or some, you know, splatter punk. And they'll also take the quiet horror as well. And they're like, hey, they like the whole, the whole serving of the table, which is also a, a cool thing about horror as well. Yeah, I, I like that you mentioned um, the quiet aspect to your work because I find that your writing is more, uh, it's more character driven and more character introspective. And that goes into the next question here from Night Fear. She says, does the story come first for you or do the characters come first? Great question. Nine out of 10 times, it's the setting for me. Hmm. It's the setting that inspires me. Uh, I don't know if we talked about this um, back on Darkness Dwells, but that that's just, um, you know, for me, when I'm getting getting my mind around the story, it's character, conflict, and setting. But, you know, talking to other writers, setting often comes last or sometimes not at all. And um, for me, it's always, the inspiration is always born out of setting. I'm like, oh, I want to write about this or this cool place. And then either either a conflict or a character comes. Often it's the character comes last, um, which I, I've learned is, is pretty backwards. I mean, I think a lot of times people come up with um, these characters, but I, um, I tend to think of the settings and then the conflicts that are inherent in those settings or that I've observed in those settings. And then it's a very inorganic, so it's a very thought out process for me to decide on the viewpoint character and the characters, whereas the other parts are more of the, you know, the mystical, oh, they just came from, they came from inspiration, so. Very cool. Um, it, it would be easy though, reading your work to think that the character comes first because you're so, like the setting, it definitely, the setting is there. You, you really notice the set, you can't help but notice the setting because oftentimes the setting becomes um, a character itself and, uh, but the characters themselves, they're so rich. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think it's because I work really hard on that. And I mean, um, when I first started writing, because of this uh, process that I told you about, the characters, <laughs> I, I hadn't developed my own uh, language or my own voice to write about characters. And a lot of the early feedback from my teachers and my colleagues were like, um, I think my characters in my early attempts felt really flat and they didn't have an internal conflicts and they didn't, they didn't have arcs because I was so focused on setting or I was so focused on a trying to make a speculative element come to life. So, you know, at, at, when, at, that, when that finally clicked for me, um, it's the part of the story that I really, um, I really work on it. You know, I mean, um, I don't know what else to say about that. So I said, th thank you. I mean, that's, um, I think it, I think it is the most character, character is conflict, character is story. Um, for me, you know, I, people I, I, are I, stories. I people, yeah. I mean, um, the stories that I connect to, even if it's the most wildest speculative element or coolest ghost story or whatever, um, if we don't have our way in and connection to the character, 
it's going to be a rough ride to connect and ultimately engage with the story. For sure. Uh, in reading uh, the introduction to uh, uh, to Underworld Dream, uh, Dreams, I was I was captured by a passage uh, where you talk about something else that excites you, and uh, you mentioned how subjective the meaning of a story can be, and how each reader can come away with different a different experience and define what the story they just read is. Um, so I was wondering, do you find that uh, do you do you interact with your readers very much, and and if so, have you gotten different interpretations of what a story might mean it, to them? Yeah, yeah, um, and that's just that's just um, such a you know writing is such a solitary. Ultimately, it's just you and the page. Um, so when I get a chance to interact with my colleagues, like we're doing here, or if I get a chance to interact with the reader, it's just so much fun, you know, and it's just so gratifying. I mean, one just to know that people uh, connected to the work and. Um, but especially for the stories in Underworld Dreams, it's really fun. Um, and I know that I've done my job that I set out to do is when you get, is when I get the opposite thing happening, where I get like two people and they've had the exact opposite experience, you know? And not like, okay, good or good or like, oh, I love the story, I hated the story, <laughs> but I get, I get that too. But it's more like, no, I, I, I tell you, it's, you know, it's an alien. No, I tell you it's a robot. You know, I mean, when you get that, <laughs> yeah. that, that split going on, I'm like, ah, oh, great. It's because um, uh, it means that intentional ambiguity, that controlled ambiguity is there, that there's enough that one reader can hang their hat on one interpretation, and there's enough where a reader can hang their hat on another interpretation, and they can hit, both have a good faith uh, debate or friendly argument on that. And neither one will be definitive. So, yeah, I think a good story from this collection to where anyone could come up with a different uh, interpretation is the monkey coat, because uh, yeah. because you give us so much information in that story for us to come up with our own explanation, and uh, that's one. I found that story was a lot of fun to read, and I was wondering if it was just as fun to write. Uh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it 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 was um it was very deliberate. You know, it was one that was very deliberate to to write. Um, and um, yeah, I remember. I yeah, I definitely remember. Uh, remember being a fun. I remember being a fun one to. I remember being a fun one to write because I definitely was. I was reading that. I remember reading that one out loud a lot, and I remember leaning a lot on my colleagues. Like I would read. I would read bits. Hey, hey, listen to this bit. You know, so I, it was a very, um, it was one of the less solitary ones that, um, so I remember it being a fun, a fun experience many summers ago, maybe on a day a lot like today, now that I come to think about it. <laughs> I kind of like how it, it was a bit of a throwback to uh, uh, some classic fiction like uh, the monkeys. Uh, uh, what is the monkey's? I want to say the monkey's paw, but that doesn't. It is, yeah. The monkey's paw is a very. Okay, that famous, is it. Okay. Uh, it didn't sound right yeah, in my head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's um, and I wasn't super familiar with the monkey's paw when I was writing it, although I had heard of it and I know I had um, read it. But um, one of the things that was also on my mind, there are a lot of things on my mind when writing that, that writing that story, but, um. Uh. Scott Nicolay, an author from the Outer Dark, had introduced me uh, to a concept of. Um, I'm gonna. There's a fancy term for it, but I'm gonna mangle it or forget it. But he said the monkey's paw was a great example of. There are stories where the object, they're object-centered stories, where the main thrust, where there are people in the stories, but the people are lesser. Their stories is lesser to uh, the object. And the monkey's paw is the classic one, right? The accursed object where the people come in contact to it. And often those stories begin with someone getting the object and end with something else. And stories where you get the sense that the story of the object is going to continue on after the stories of the humans have finished. So that was something that was on my mind when writing um, The Monkey Code as well, as in addition to the other things I wanted to write in that story. Um, I found that you were 
in some of these stories you were playing around with some with some familiar tropes and i think the one that where you it seemed like you played the most with tropes was uh, the story between our earth and their moon because you have so many things going on in this story it is a science fiction story it's a noir detective story and uh and it's also an urban fantasy like oh my god how did you mix all those things together <laughs> you know the, the the answer to that is i didn't even try you know that just sort of goes back to that was one of the older stories in the book and <laughs> You know, it's like, that's me, like, throwing a dart, and I'm thinking I'm aiming at that place in the dartboard, and, and it's going somewhere off on the wall. But but seriously, um, what I wanted to write, the inspiration for that story was, I wanted to, I was playing around with the concept of how some, some thing, things are not what they appear to be. So the story starts off where one character is hiring another to take care of his problem, his his, his haunting problem. So you think it's going to be this sort of supernatural noir where it's like, oh God, here comes the supernatural detective. He's hired to get rid of the ghosts. And I think a lot about ghosts. I think a lot about ghost stories. Um, and there are so many interesting things that a ghost can be. Um, Tim Powers, uh, one of my favorite authors, plays around with this a lot. So that's how that came across because I wanted to just have a story where it showed someone initially thought what was happening in the story was ghosts, and what it turns out to be is something else. Something, you know, fantastical as well. So that's uh, that's how, you know, uh, all the different, it appears to be the story that is crossing all these different genres. And yes, it has the hallmarks of different genres, but I think if I tried, if I tried to put those ingredients into a sandwich and serve it up as a story, it wouldn't hold together. <laughs> I think it was an unintentional crossing. <laughs> That's interesting because when when you're reading a story like that, you kind of have to pause and think. Did did he plan? Uh, you just answered yourself or this question, but it was actually in my questions here because I had to stop and think. My God, like there's so much going on in the story. I love it, uh, and so I had to wonder. It's like, did he plan on on mixing all these things together? <laughs> Is he a mad scientist? Does he sit down and say, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm going to be mixing this and this and this. I'd love, I'd love to be a mad scientist. The, the thought of, <laughs> the thought of being a mad scientist, and especially, but I think even more importantly, I think it's it's great to just feel, to feel confident and free, and um, and I think that's one of the great things about the horror genre, um, is that it's it's accepting as to where the story goes, right? Is it going to you know, is it like Hellraiser? Is it going to be in a, a creepy haunted house or is it going to be up in space or is it going to be in another dimension? You know, like where, where as long as it's a good story, um, the storytellers and readers are willing to go into amazing places. And, you know, I'm really glad that you pointed out um, Between Our Earth and Their Moon. I uh, was really su surprised but pleasantly surprised that that was, that was a story that got, um, that got mentioned in, in reviews a lot. Um, the character in that story is a recurring character, and uh, this, is, this is something I've, I've only mentioned in one or two other places, but uh, the character in that story is going to be um, the main character in a novel that's coming out from uh, Lev Press uh, next awesome. year, called Servant of the Eighth Wind. So I'm glad that people liked um, that story isn't very much, a, it's not really a strange tale, because it, it, sort of, it sort of fakes being a strange tale, but then I think it moves out of being a strange tale because there is a definitive answer. The ambiguity is resolved. And in the strange tale, the ambiguities are not resolved. So, you know, it's closer to being a uh, straight up genre, plural, <laughs> than my other tales. <laughs> so, you know, I'm excited to be able to bring that character and that kind of storytelling in a uh, larger format coming next summer. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, oh, thank you. We have another audience question from Nikki. Uh, her channel, Dark Between Pages. She says, extremely hard question, I know, but do you have a favorite piece of yours? Um, right, I think the favorite story is like the one that you're working on now, but or at, at any given time. But um, uh, today it's um, how, to, how to stay afloat when drowning. Uh, I don't know, just because I just read it. And I think it's a story that, you know, look, not... 
not all of our stories published or otherwise hit the mark, hit the mark that we wanted to do. But, you know, that was one that I was lucky enough where I feel like it hit the mark of what I wanted to um, achieve in the story. And it was a story that, um, that connected with a lot of readers. So I'm feeling, today I'm feeling really good about that story. So I'll pick that one. Thank oh, you should feel good about that story because like I said, it was a really, really good story to start the collection off with because it, it sets it sets the tone. And uh, one, one thing I, I really enjoyed about this collection was uh, it's called Underworld Dreams. And I had a question about how did you choose the stories to go in there? Was there a sort of dreamy uh, feel you were going for or maybe theme? Because all the stories, I don't know if it was the title that influenced this reading experience of mine, but all the stories had sort of like a dreamlike quality for me. Yeah, um, I wanted this book. Um, this was a book that I wrote. Um, and as I was writing the stories and, and when I knew that it was going to be a collection, um, which was several years before it was published, I knew um, I knew that it was going to be a book of strange tales. I knew it was going to be a book the one thing that I wanted every story to be the guiding theme was the intentional ambiguities. And I wanted it to be a strange tale to fit the definition of the Robert Aikman strange tale. Not all of them really held up to that, but that, that was the, um, that was the intention. So it was, it was, um, it was not a dreamlike um, process at all. It was very, it was very intentional. It went through very different iterations. Um, my editor worked with me, uh, Steve Berman from Left Press. Um, he was a great editor. He understood um, uh, that what I, I just said right there. And he really helped me um, pick and choose the stories. And, um, and some of the stories were written intentionally. The title story in particular, Underworld Dreams, was written as like the backbone of, of the book. I had a, a kind of funny experience, not funny, but a, a very coincidental experience that obviously wasn't planned because I had no idea what the story is going to be about. But I ended up reading uh, Plankar on Father's mm -hmm. Day. <laughs> oh, boy. I was, hey. I was, yeah. I was stories, sitting up. stories to put you in the mood by Dan Brom. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> it was Father's Day, and I'm, I'm sitting there reading this story, and I'm like, wow, what a story to be reading during Father's Day. <laughs> yeah, for but, you know, those if, you haven't read Paul and Carr yet, I mean, this is that's a book, it's a story that has two very questionable fathers in it, you know, or yeah. fathers, um, yeah, being pretty arguably not, not good fathers. I, I found it's not just like a father and son story. It's also very much a family story um, because there's that strong uh, relationship between the brothers where the one brother is trying to break away and just do his own thing because he can't, he can't do it anymore. And, and you have uh, the other brother who the, the perspective is from, he's trying to, uh, he's trying to hold things together basically. Yeah. I, the story felt, as though it was very personal in a way. And I was just wondering, you don't have to answer, of course, but I was just wondering if it was personal at all because it really affected me, even though I don't relate to it necessarily, but because I'm a father, it, anytime I read a father-son story, I begin to question my own parenting skills. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I love the question. And um, so on the one hand, it, it, it couldn't be more personal. And on the other hand, it wasn't personal at all. And what I mean by that is I'm not, I, I'm not a father. Um, so I never, I never experienced those feelings uh, that I'm writing about. However, you know, you know, some, there are fathers close to me in my life and some of the more shocking things that fathers over the years have um, told to me, you know, when they, people became new fathers, I don't know if you, you don't, you don't have to answer it in return. Sometimes like fathers have told me the, up, the outright terror of being a father and the responsibility. They were just like, I, I can't do this. I don't, how am I going to do this? I can't take, you know, just the, the, and maybe it's a good sign. Maybe, you, maybe fathers have to go through that of just feeling the weight of the responsibility and confiding to a friend 
in the terror. So that was where that emotion came from. You know, more than one of uh, my friends who became new fathers just confided in me their utter feelings of ho of uh, not being worthy. And, you know, I just played that emotion down the line of like, you know, ultimately these people, they got their act together. And like we were, I think we were talking about this before we went on the air. Hey, yeah. being a father, being in the family is, is putting your priority on top and then being flexible. Like, hey, I don't know how I'm going to juggle this, but yeah. I'm going to make it happen. So I think people make it happen. But this, I took the story, I took that to an extreme and said, well, what if there's a father who can't make it happen? And he wants out. And I guess there are fathers who do that. And this is the story. The viewpoint character is someone saying, um, and the inspiration for the story came of the other brother trying to bring him back. And uh, I think the story strays from this, but my inspiration for that is in life, we can only go so far to help rescue, save people. Ultimately, you can't help, you can't rescue people if they're going to take you somewhere where then the both of you are going to drown. And I wanted to sort of capture capture that feeling in the story in Pollen Car. And of course, to me, stories stories aren't exciting unless they have a supernatural element to them. So <laughs> <laughs> I tried to explain that with, with the catalyst of a supernatural experience. Yeah, it's it's very well done though. My God, that's that's another story that really touched me, and it's probably because of the father and son relationships. Oh, uh, like, you. like I said, uh, when I read stories that are that well done, I always have to stop, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, am I am I a good father? Am <laughs> <laughs> am I doing okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and thank you, thank you for asking the question. I mean, um, uh, for asking. You know, if it was real or because um, I think that's a that's a big compliment. I mean, I had I had an old friend read um, one of my stories um, the other day, and she um, she was horrified. She was like, "Oh no, how how do you know this? I'm so sorry that." And I'm like, "Oh no 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 no, I, I didn't go through that. It didn't happen." You know, and they're like, "Oh, yes, I'm so sorry." So it's a huge, um, it's a huge um, right. It's a huge compliment if if, if the story if, if it feels true or if. If a reader believes that it's real, you know, I yeah. think then, then we, um, then we as writers have done our job. Um, again, I'll say something by, by Tim Powers, one of my favorite authors, in one of his uh, guest of honor speeches at a convention. This thing always struck with me. Um, you know, we're in, in stories. We're telling falsehoods. We're not telling the truth. But our job is to inspire the reaction in people as if it was, you know, was absolutely unquestionably true. And he used the example of a, uh, something of chickens and a chicken hawk, I guess, uh, farm raised chickens. They live generations, generations, generations in these warehouses where they're raised and bred and they've never been outside. They've never seen the sun. They've never seen another animal and they've never seen another predator. But some people would do these experiments and they would take a silhouette of a chicken hawk, you know, a natural predator, and they would put it on a reel and they would fly it across the warehouse and it would inspire the chickens all to go absolutely bonkers and crazy. Where does this come from? They've no, no one's taught them. You know, there was no grandma chicken or relative chicken that could have passed it down from the information that to be afraid of it. They've never seen it before, but it was something, something about that even though it was a falsehood that inspired the truth. So I think that's, uh, I'm losing the metaphor here, but Tim Powers said it really well. That's our job is to inspire that sort of reaction in uh, our readers. Awesome. Um, the title story, Underworld Dreams, is uh, it's the novella length story in this collection. Um, have you ever considered uh, self-publishing that one or, or finding a, a, a traditional publisher to uh, to release it as like, you know, just its own story? Um, I'm not opposed to that at all. I mean, uh, this is a, it's so, it's so closely, it's so closely associated with this project and this book. I think it would be um, not really a candidate for that, but I've done that once or twice. Um, I've self-published a, uh, a story called The Yeti's Hand. Um, it was my first short story that was ever published. It was published in a, a magazine, uh, an online magazine called The Fortean Bureau, which is a cryptozoological spec fic mag uh, 
aimed after the Fordian times of Charles Fort. And then, um, and then after that one uh, closed, uh, I, for its 10th anniversary, I, uh, I made like a, um, a limited pressing of it, uh, a limited edition. So I'm not, I'm not opposed to doing that. I'm not really, I don't really have the know-how, uh, but I like, um, you know, I like zines. I like limited chapbooks. Um, Night, Nightscape Press does the standalone thing. I'd love to work with them and do something like that. I've worked with Dim Shores Press before. Um, they, they've done projects akin to that. So um, I love the format. I love the standalone format. Awesome. All right. So um, it's getting late. So I thought we'd get into uh, some uh, a different vein of questions, if that's good with you. Yeah. Yeah. I also, I, I definitely also want to shout out, I think if this is the part where we talk about what we're reading or what uh, some things are on our radar. Yeah, exactly. I was wondering what you've been reading. Oh, cool. I'm looking forward to it. So what have you been reading lately That's uh, that's been uh, getting you all excited? Oh, wow. Um, well, so the first one, um, so before I forget, I, I just want to uh, make a shout out to my one of my publishers, Lev Press. Uh, it's run by Steve Berman. Um, they, they experienced the 20th anniversary this year, 20, 20 wow. years for a small press publisher. That's like, I don't know, in, I don't want to say dog years or publisher years, but like that's that just doesn't happen, you know. Um, for the first 10 years, they published um, mostly, um, mostly queer fiction. And then over the last 10 years, they expanded uh, to um, – to more weird fiction and fiction by straight authors as well. Um, I just want to shout out a couple. So happy 20th birthday to Lev. Um, yeah, thank you sure. so much for bringing me in there. They published Underworld Dreams. They published a book that I edited called Spirits Unwrapped, which is an anthology of mummy stories. And some of my favorites over the years, they published, um, we talked about noir a little bit. Uh, one of my favorite authors is Lee Thomas. Uh, the story that he's got with Lev is called Down on Your Knees. It's set in New Orleans. It's a hard-boiled noir story, Down on Your Knees by Lee Thomas. I love it. Check it out from Lev Press. Um, another great weird fiction book from Lev Press is Sleeping with the Monster by Anya Martin. Anya Martin is uh, one of the producers of The Outer Dark. Um, she runs with Scott Nicolay, the Outer Dark Symposium on the Greater Weird. And her, her collection is called Sleeping with the Monster. That was out from Leth Press a couple of years back. It's really, uh, it's really great. Um, oh, someone is writing, Underworld Dream sounds like an amazing 80s song. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo I love it. Yeah, I once, I once had, someone once criticized me and, and said that some of my titles sound like, a really bad 70s prog rock song. And I'm like, I'm taking that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, is there any is there any bad 70s prog rock? Like honestly. There there, there could be, but I don't know. I, I, if there is, I haven't I haven't come across it yet, you know. Yeah. Um yeah, and the other uh Lev also they 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 uh acquired the rights to an author that um I'm gonna say his name wrong because that's my X-Men superpower. Um, Philip <laughs> Fricasi, I apologize, Philip, if I'm saying your name wrong, um, but they, Lev also put out um, Behold the Void, that was his first collection, and so what am I excited about? I haven't read it yet, uh, Philip's got a new collection out, uh, Beneath a Pale Sky, that's also, also from Lev Press, so uh, I'm super excited to read that one. Yeah, I'm going to be reading that one to... soon, I, I love yeah. Philip Fricasi. Yeah, he's so such a great author. He does. He he's another guy that writes. He writes that horror, uh, really character driven. He writes. He also writes a wide range, but he can also do that quiet horror really spot on. For sure. Well. Um, happy book birthday to one of my favorite authors, uh, Jeffrey Ford. Oh, Jeff Ford. Jeffrey Ford. Yeah. yeah. Ford. Um, you're in for a treat. A uh, big dark hole. Um, look, Jeff isn't often thought about as horror, but, um, he's one of those guys on the interstitial places. He's one of those people on the borderlands, um, big dark hole. One of my favorite short stories that came out the last few years. I mean, it's one of those ones that when you talk about that hits you, it gives you a gut punch and you just don't see it coming. Um, 
totally believable. Jeff writes, he writes all his characters come alive with his voice, young narrators, narrators young and looking back at stories over different places at times. This is this this collection is a masterwork. It comes out today from Small Beer Press. Um, That's funny because uh, before we started, before we went live, I, I mentioned uh, the Philip Fricassi book. It, it came out recently, and I, I was confused if it came out today or not. But it wasn't that book I was thinking about that came out today. It was oh, okay. The, it was the Ford. Oh, book. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we look. We all know. We all shop at Amazon. I shop at Amazon. Um, a couple of places where you can, I always like to give a shout out to some of my favorite indie bookstores. Um, we got Books Incorporated over in Berkeley, California. Um, they may have a copy of Underworld Dreams or some of those books that um, we mentioned, or they can order them. Another bookstore that really supports the indie and the small press is uh, the Green Hand Bookstore over in Portland, Maine. Again, you can shop online with them too, or you can shop in person. Uh, they have a great selection of small press and indie books, and they, they're also happy to order it for you. And uh, someone else who's uh, supported me is um, uh, the Book Bin in Salem, Oregon. I know, I'm not sure if any of these places have any copies of Underworld Dreams left, but they'd be happy to get them for you. And um, yeah, if you're, you feel like supporting uh, the small press, these are a couple that I um, I like to check out. Awesome. What, what's what's been on your radar? I've got more I could share with you. I don't want to yeah, take yeah. The, whole, the whole time though. What's uh, anything else on your radar, Jason? Um, you know what? There's so many books I need to get to. Um, Nikki from Dark Between Pages always goes on about how big her uh, TBR is, and oh. and I, I I have the same issue. But let me tell you, um, the uh, the Ford book there and the Fercassi book, those are. Yeah. Those are ones I'm going to be hitting up like almost in me. Oh, Vestarian. You know what? I absolutely yeah, this, love that. It just came in the mail today. Where is it? Um, this one's the most recent one. It just came in the mail. Um, yeah, Vestarian. What a great. I'm, he, what I'm a, great a huge John Paget fan. Yeah, John. I'm not sure if you tuned in. Uh, John Paget, um, last month or maybe a little less than a month ago, he was one of the readers. Um, I do a reading series, um, you know, The Strange, the Weird, and the Uncanny. Um, John Paget was headlining that last month. You can check on my YouTube page. That what was a, a lot what of a reader fun. That, what a reader that guy is, man! Can he, man? Can he perform? He's a performer. And uh, yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no way around that. He's just an amazing performer and an amazing author. Um, Jeff Ford is an amazing reader as well. And July fifteenth, um, if you go over to my YouTube page, which I think is Daniel Brom. Um, <laughs> I should have known what that is. You could you could find it pretty easily. Just put my name into YouTube or on my social media. And Jeff Ford's going to be reading along with uh, the great uh, Gwendolyn Keist, um, Laurel Hightower, and some others. Um, we're going to be doing group reading, but we'll definitely be celebrating uh, Jeff Ford's uh, release. Um, two other authors um, I'm always excited about. Um, John Langan, his, his most recent is uh, Children of the Fang. Uh, he's got another one coming out next summer from yeah, Ford and um, and Laird Barron always inspires. Here's just you know I'm catching up and reading uh, these short stories, but you know he's got um, he's got some interesting books out now. Um, I think he's got three of them, three novels there, um, more like contemporary, you know, a lot closer to that true detective vibe. Of, yeah, uh, I absolutely of love that very uh, supernatural detective thing going on. Isaiah Coleridge, I believe, is the name of his uh, recurring hero, which is an absolute uh, pleasure. Yeah. Hey, hey, Michael, how are you? Our old friend here from Darkness Dwells Podcast. Great to, hey, great Michael. To, great to hear from you. <laughs> and yeah, so little, so many books, so little time. Uh, you said someone said her, her pile was too big. I'm going to the grave with my to-be-read pile. And you know what? What a beautiful feeling that is, though. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, like, I sometimes you can feel so overwhelmed by, like, I've been reading so slow, and especially when I write, I read even slower. But I can't stop buying books. I'm still going to buy them because I still love them. I love to have them, and I love to support people. And uh, what a great joy to know that um, I'm never going to be without something good to read. <laughs> so at least there's that. Yeah. All right, so um, I think that's it. Um, 
it was interesting because um, I, I was talking to Mike Thorne, I think last, and I had a, a technical issue there and it's coming back. So I don't think it was my headphones. I think it's actually my microphone that's uh, malfunctioning. So, so I want to thank you, Daniel. Thank for you. Coming on. Thank you, Jason. And what an absolute pleasure. And thank you for having me back on the show. Thank you for reading Underworld Dreams. Thank you for your kind words about it. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. Anytime. Uh, anytime you want to come back on the show, you want to promote something, or if you just want to chat, like seriously, just uh, just. I'd love up. to. Let's yeah. Let's um. Let, yeah. Uh, I'll come back for both. I'll come back next summer when the novel hits, and hopefully we'll come back before then. We'll uh, think of some fun. You know, let's talk writing and let's talk horror because what a joy it is. What so much fun. Thank you so much, man. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to what you're doing this summer on your own uh, YouTube channel. If I remember, I'm going to put a link to that down there. But everyone who's uh, watching, definitely go check out Daniel Brahms' channel. Um, as he said, he's doing uh, live readings with uh, a bunch of guests. And I caught the last one, and it was so much fun. It, it really made my Friday night. I was working the whole day beforehand. Mm -hmm. And when I came home, I plugged that into my ears and it was just, uh, it was beautiful. <laughs> There's a lot of talent out there. Um, and you know, John Padgett, Jeff Ford, you know, these, they make it look easy, but all right. They're the, they're the masters. Well, thank you. It's okay if I call you Dan. It seems everyone calls you Dan. Dan's great. Just, you know, uh, just don't call me late for dinner. How's that? The old grandpa joke goes, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for coming on. I'm going to end the broadcast now. And, uh, and goodbye, everyone. Thanks for coming. And thanks for asking questions. <laughs>